the coronavirus is officially a pandemic. Une urgence de santé publique internationale. Alarming levels of inaction. Est-ce que c'est un virus que vous avez sous-estimé, Dr. Abouda? The world has changed. And our worlds have changed. The way we live, the way we work, our sense of safety. Énormément de voitures toute la journée dans ces supermarchés. C'est normal d'être inquiet. C'est une infection qu'on découvre présentement. Il y a des choses qui posent COVID-19 et des choses que je ne pourrais plus prendre pour acquis, dont la vie. We're set up to have a pretty good year. But now, everything is so up in the air. 2020 has been a year, y'all, and we've covered more than 200 stories. Et nous, on a reçu vraiment beaucoup de questions des jeunes à travers le Canada au complet. It's really important that we have credible sources and facts. Quoi ça sert? C'est saloperie-là de virus dans la vie. Pourquoi ça existe? <laughs> There is no going back. Our role as journalists is to reveal truths and bear witness, no matter how uncomfortable they are. Expect many arrests throughout the night. This is a knife's edge. Speak up! Hear us now! It's not just me who is suffering through this, and everybody's in the same boat. We're still at it. That's got to get past that point. Also, it'll always be the same. We're not to fear. We are to respect. If there is a way that I can help somebody, I'm going to do it. C'est une nouvelle vie qui s'annonce pour nous tous collectivement. On va passer à travers ce printemps-là ensemble. We're not going anywhere until these eyebrows grow back. J'ai décidé d'aller voir comment ça se passe dans le métro. Look at these people. See if they're qualified. Give them an opportunity. Love each other, take care of each other. We do the right things. Things will work out for us. The social distance power of celebration. How are you feeling about seeing your two daughters today? It's an outpouring of positive support for each other. Tout le monde partage partout dans le monde et ça va nous permettre d'aller plus rapidement. Teams are busy at work helping their local community. <laughs> Separate all the tables. We limited the seating. We'll be here with you. Thank you. Si la tendance se maintient, ça va bien aller. Woo! Vancouver. Bonjour tout le monde. Hello everyone. Ici Alexis de Lancer, en compagnie de Catherine et Michael. This Bonjour à vous deux. Alexis de Lancer with Catherine and Mark. Michael, hello. We're happy to be here today in Montreal in this brand new CBC building, freshly painted. It's a great, a great pleasure to be with you for this first virtual event for our annual public meeting. Obviously, it's circumstantial. Catherine, you are uh, president and CEO. Oh, Michael, you are, yes, board chair for CBC Radio Canada, but it's important to say as well that mainly you are the chancellor of Bishop's University in Sherbrooke. It's been a challenging year. Yes, intense, and now with people going back to school in September. Yes, the whole society has been subject to the consequences of this pandemic. So we are all virtual now. Let's come back to you, Michael, about these months of crisis. What was your primary concern from the outset of the crisis? Well, as we all know, this is a really big country. Mm -hmm. um, and we broadcast and uh, provide material in both English and French and several indigenous languages. So yeah. it's, a, it's a huge challenge that CBC Radio Canada has. We're present in more than 60, I think, uh, locations across the country. From the perspective of the board, I would say we had two big concerns. 
the first was, are we doing enough to inform, provide Canadians with the information they require in this unique situation that none of us had lived before? Mm -hmm. And I have to say, uh, what gave the board enormous pleasure was that the Canadians came to CBC Radio Canada in record numbers, on television, on radio, on digital. So it's, it's reassuring that the public turns to its public's broadcaster when there are really significant moments in the history of our country. It means so a lot, eh? It means a lot to, as board members, and it's uh, to everyone who works in the organization, that, 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 that we really matter in people's lives. The second component is that we are an employer. We have 7,500 employees across the country, and each of those individuals were faced with the challenge that all Canadians were facing. How do I continue to do my job? How do I meet my obligations while keeping myself safe, keeping my family safe, keeping my friends safe? And that we managed, under Catherine's leadership, to do this in a way, to continue to be providing information to Canadians every day, 24 hours a day, while keeping our people safe. That was an enormous undertaking, and as a board member, and on behalf of the board, I can say, we're enormously proud of the, the work that everybody did in both of those areas to ensure that we would both be ensuring the safety of our employees mm. and informing Canadians through an exceptional circumstance that none of us had ever envisaged. And it's not over yet. Right? And it's far from over. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> we'll see for how long. I was, in, from the my perspective, from inside, mm. was absolutely crazy. But I'm really proud of what we did. I say we in a large sense. Right. If we look at this sort of with a retrospective, what lessons were learned in this turbulence? We're coming out of it now? Well, we have learned a lot, a number of lessons. But the main lesson, I think, if I may, is the fundamental value that Canadians attribute to regional services, as Michael just said. And it's how close we are with citizens across the country. It's important for minority communities, linguistic and minority linguistics, francophones in Winnipeg, Regina, Moncton, or indigenous peoples in the north. So for those folks, we are really a lifeline. And we feel that attachment, and we felt it even more substantially during the pandemic. There have been a number of lessons, but that was a big one. An achievement, yes. uh, and uh, we were able to achieve it uh, mainly because of um, uh, because we were digitally present wherever we, we had to, right? I mean, we operate our services in television, radio, exactly. and digital. So we're working, as you know, as you do, uh, we're working on all platforms. But what we've understood with the um, with our uh, digital presence is that we were there for Canadians in real time. And as Michael was saying, in this period of a health crisis, uh, time was very, very important. Mm -hmm. And that network of digital that we've built, uh, we saw our numbers, our traffic rise to over 24 million unique visitors um, each month wow. to Radio-Canada and cbc.ca. Uh, we became the most visited web destination in Canada after Google, Facebook, and Microsoft. So this was an enormous accomplishment but really importantly, it, we became Canada's uh, really tr uh, uh, most trusted uh, service during this time, and it's a huge honor. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I say it with humility, uh, it, was, it was enormously inspirational, and that's why some of the great work uh, that we've seen come out of, um, out of your group, mm -hmm. but also across the company. But we weren't, it wasn't just about providing more news or more frequent news, it was about combating disinformation around yeah. COVID-19. There was as much misinformation circulating in social media as there was good information. And so, the decryptors, uh, the disinformation unit, worked with hundreds and hundreds of pieces of, of uh, news items to, to counter misinformation. So, mm -hmm. really valuable information. But also, on the entertainment front, we had to serve uh, all those families and kids in lockdown. 
Mm -hmm. What were they going to do all mm -hmm. day long? Mm -hmm. And so we uh, we made our service, our educational service, curio free to all Canadians. We acquired more Canadian content uh, for them to view, and we saw them come, as Michael said, in droves to our services. Um, and finally, I really do feel I should mention that probably one of the sectors most hit by COVID has been the creative community, our artists, our cultural creators across the country. And how could we serve that group? Well, we did it through amazing programming like La, La Fête des Mamans mm -hmm, here mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, Quebec, but also by bringing theater to podcasts. We brought, uh, yeah. we produced theater um, in, pod, in the podcast format. So there were many, many initiatives. And what was really touching to me was how inventive, how innovative, and how creative our teams were at CBC and Radio Canada. They really were. were. They really, really, were. really great. Et ce que je trouve intéressant, Michael, aussi dans tout ça. And what I find interesting, Michael, in all of this is how all generations were called upon. Um, because of CBC and Radio Canada. And you know what your perspective is. You're from education. So that's one of the big pillars of CBC, right? Education? Yes, absolutely. The role of the board is not operations. The role of the board is to set strategies, broad strategies for CBC Radio Canada. And one of these strategies was to attract young people's attention. And as Catherine just said, you know, when I work with the university, Young people of all ages were at home, so the quality of content for them was so crucial. The programming needed to reflect their interests, and they needed to see themselves in it. So the fact that Catherine and the board set all of that as a goal, one of the main goals for the corporation, even before the pandemic, was that we were in place to rise to the challenge of educating. Sometimes we feel like CBC Radio Canada is for old people like me. But in reality, young people across the country are very attached to their public broadcaster as well. So that was one of the big priorities. Obviously, as Catherine said, local presence is essential. The pandemic is uh, is a national and global phenomenon, but we also experience it locally. I live in Sherbrooke. And the fact that CBC and Radio Canada is present in at Sherbrooke, in Sherbrooke, I often got information from one or the other. And this is the case for Canadians across the country. Local is so crucial. Local is so important. And it's even more important now because of the pandemic. The third thing for us as a board is to ensure that our programming is diversified, that it really reflects Canadians, not just on the waves, but across all platforms. That's one of Catherine's big platforms. Ever since she arrived, we knew, as a board, that she wanted CBC Radio Canada to do more. So we've done a lot. But what's clear, and the board is fully behind Catherine around this, and that is that we want to do more, much more. So yes, the pandemic was a challenge, but it allowed us to see certain things, move forward on other things more quickly than what we would have thought. Yes, we have also f said that a crisis is an opportunity. Yes, it, for us it was a golden opportunity for diversity. diversity. So that will accelerate? Absolutely. This issue of diversity, we also talk about inclusion because ultimately it's not just about what you see on the screen. We want to make sure that it's behind the screen, or writers, producers, directors, but also in our workforce. We want to see um, people uh, advance through the organization so they see themselves at all levels in the organization. So we've set some pretty um, ambitious targets, mm -hmm. and I'm convinced we'll get there. Uh, we're focused on it. We've made, uh, we've set targets like in, uh, for in independent production by the year 2025. We want to know that any show that we commission, one of the three creative decision makers, so writer, director, producer, mm -hmm. Um, will be a, a person from a diverse um, background. That's it. That's a, I, in my mind, uh, ultimately, to Michael's point, that's when young Canadians will see themselves on the screen. 
They'll hear their stories. They'll understand that we are relevant to them, and that's how we secure a place for the public broadcaster in the future. I hope so, because that was a very dear theme for me. Thank you to the two of you, Catherine and Michael, for this great conversation. Alexei, if I may, normally, for our annual meeting, I ask each member of the board to introduce themselves. But because we're doing this virtually, if you may allow me, I'd like to introduce them to you because they come from across the country. They are here to represent Canadians, and I would like to take a moment to introduce them to you. Ah, oh, please do, please do. Guillaume Agnorte from Montreal. Suzanne Givremont, also from Montreal. Rob Jeffrey from Halifax, René Léger. René Léger from Moncton, Sandra Mason. Sandra Mason from Toronto, Jennifer, Mo Jennifer Moore Rattray Winnipeg. from Winnipeg, Sandra, Sandra Singh from Vancouver, Bill Tam. Bill Tam, who's also from Vancouver, François Roy from Montreal, and finally Marie, and finally, Marie Wilson from Yellowknife. So, Alexi, we have an incredible board. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to introduce them to you. I'm pleased to have done that. You're lucky to be surrounded uh, by such great people. Yes, I am surrounded by great people. Thank you very much to you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Catherine, for this great discussion. This gets us started off really nicely for the rest. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Bonjour à vous tous. Welcome to your annual Public Broadcasters 2020 Annual Public Meeting. My name is Patricia Bitucci-Coudi, host of the morning radio show on ICI Première at Radio-Canada in Manitoba. And I am coming to you live from Winnipeg. I'll be the host of this event. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are on Treaty 1 territory and that the land is the traditional territory of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and also the homeland of the Métis Nation. My name is Patricia Bitu Chikudi. My name is Patricia Bitu Tetsuki. I am the host of the morning radio show at ICI Première, Radio Canada, Montreal, Montreal uh, Manitoba, and I will be coming with you live from Winnipeg. I will be your host for this 2020 annual public meeting. I'd like to begin by telling you that we are on Treaty 1 territory. This is traditional territory for the Anishinaabe, Cree, Ojibwe, Cree, Dakota, and Dene, and the Cree, the Métis Nation. That alone is pretty loaded, but you know what? We are absolutely delighted to present our first virtual annual public meeting, which despite the format still invites you at home, you Canadians, to ask your questions regarding your public broadcaster. And to make sure that you get the best answers to your questions, well, we have the chair of the board of directors along with the senior executive team of CBC Radio Canada right here with us. You will see them in a few seconds. Uh, notre objectif uh, tout au long de cette assemblée. Our goal throughout this public meeting will be to answer all of your questions. And for those of you who are not familiar with how this annual public meeting takes place, you can know that you will be able to ask the steering committee questions. You will be able to ask questions of the board chair as well. So please submit your questions by email to APA or APM at cbc.ca and on social media as well, Facebook and Twitter, you can use RCA as the hashtag. So send us your questions by email at apm at cbc.ca or uh, on our Facebook live event or through Twitter using the hashtag CBC. Given that our time is limited, you'll understand that we won't be able to necessarily answer all of your questions. However, the more frequently questions and the answers will be posted on the institutional website belonging to CBC Radio Canada a little bit later on. So, now that I've done those introductions, let's get going. It's time to take questions. To help us answer the questions, we have the board with us. 
And CBC executives. The first question comes from Regina in Saskatchewan. Hello to our listeners in Saskatchewan. The first question would be for uh, Michael Goldblum. Uh, the question goes like this. Could you please share your detailed definition of a Canadian public broadcaster or public media enterprise with specific reference to the initial objectives of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. How do you see that definition as having evolved in the 21st century? Now, this is quite the question. I think the person who wrote it really took his time thinking about it. And what a great way to start the conversation. Michael Goldblum, whenever you're ready, uh, please answer the question. Thank you, Patricia, and, and thank you for the question, and hello to everyone. Um, you know, a really important question, I think, to begin our, our discussion, because I think every generation of Canadians has to determine for itself what it expects from our public broadcaster. It was, I think, in 1929, so 91 years ago, that the Aired Commission recommended the creation of a national radio network, and then a few years later, in the early 1930s, Prime Minister R.B. Bennett proposed and established the creation of what was then called the Canadian Radio Broadcasting Commission, which ultimately became the CBC. So what was behind that? It was really, in fact, the invention of radio and the fact it was a cultural sovereignty argument at the time, which I think continues to apply. But, you know, uh, American radio was becoming very popular and having influence in Canada. And the government of the day felt it was important that we should have our own broadcaster, and that's how the CBC came into being. Under the Broadcasting Act, which governs CBC Radio Canada, we have three main obligations, to inform, to enlighten, and to entertain. So we started doing that on radio in the 1930s. And then in 1950, uh, technology evolved and along came television. So of course, we, um, we moved into television while continuing to broadcast in radio. And now, in the 21st century, of course, there's the internet and, and mobile devices. So in my view, it's not actually the platform that matters. It's the mission. It's our fundamental mission. And I don't believe that fundamental mission has changed in any significant way in these 91 years. It's to serve Canadians with trusted Canadian content on whatever device they use. And Catherine alluded to this in our previous conversation. You know, the pandemic has made it very, very clear how important it is that we reach Canadians on radio, on television, and digitally. And as she mentioned, which I think is so impressive, that our, our, our traffic, digital traffic, went up considerably, I think 15%. And now it's something like 24, 25 million Canadians come to our digital platforms every month. So think about that. That's a, a very large percentage of, of Canadians all across the country. And we are, you know, we are the, the most significant digital um, service in Canada after Google, Microsoft, and Facebook. So I think it's extraordinarily gratifying that in a time of crisis, that Canadians of all ages have turned to their public broadcaster for information and for and for entertainment. Don't the platform change? May la mission. So platforms change, but the mission to inform and entertain remains the same. Caster, in my view, is to serve Canadians by connecting them to each other, by informing them about their country, and by giving expression to the rich diversity and complexity of Canada. So that would be my answer as to what our mission is in the 21st century. And I would say that this is a great answer. And I'm glad to hear you talk about uh, doing something in, in the broadcasting world to uh, entertain, to uh, give uh, the Canadian information. This is something that I, we hear. I am a host of a morning show. And these are things we hear from our bosses. So glad to hear that uh, even higher up, you know, this is something that is very important to you. So I hope uh, this question really uh, was uh, um, good for uh, our listeners who did ask that question. Uh, ma prochaine question maintenant, My next question now is a question in line with COVID-19. 
many industries, and that's a question from a pub, um, one of our listeners. And uh, so the question is, COVID-19 has hit many industries, including media. And um, what is the financial impact on CBC, Radio-Canada, and will there be cuts to services or jobs? And that's a very important question in the, this actual context. And this question, I will direct it to uh, Catherine Tate. So thank you, uh, Patricia, um, and thank you um, for that question uh, from wherever that Canadian resides. Um, there is absolutely no doubt that, uh, uh, that the COVID crisis the last six months has had an impact on CBC Radio Canada. Like all media companies, we've been hit uh, with lower advertising revenues. But I think, as I said earlier in the, my conversation with Michael, as the public broadcaster, we are so enormously privileged to receive public funding. And this has been vital to maintaining the programs and the services that Canadians depend on, especially during this unprecedented crisis. In response to COVID, we, like all the colleagues, all our colleagues in the media industry, reduced costs, wherever possible. We froze a discretionary spending. We delayed or suspended capital improvements in order to contain costs, but we didn't cut services. In fact, we added more news coverage, more COVID information, and more entertainment programming. So to be clear, each year, uh, CBC Hydro Canada has to manage financial pressures from declines in traditional television revenue, both advertising and subscription, as well as the portion of our budget that is not indexed uh, for inflation. So practically, this means that at the start of each year, we're in a negative position, COVID aside. And we have to manage our operations responsibly to meet that budget. So while there are adjustments to our operations, both for um, just budgetary reasons or for strategic initiative reasons, we're extremely focused on maintaining service to Canadians, especially during this crisis. And, and really, we do not anticipate cutting service at this time. I think as we move to the next phase of the pandemic, the work of, the, of Canada's public broadcaster, as, as Michael just said, will be more important than ever to ensure that Canadians have the information that they trust and to support the healthy recovery of Canada's creative industries. Thanks, Patricia. I'm very reassured. I'm sure our listeners are as well. So as long as there's no sort of loss around services offered by CBC Radio Canada. Please stay with us, Catherine, because the next question is for you. CBC Radio Canada plays an important role, and its mandate is to represent all cultures in Canada. So here's the question. What concrete actions will you take to be able to better recognize these cultures? Yes, thank you, Patricia. And we did indeed talk to Michael earlier about the important role of diversity and inclusion at CBC Radio Canada. But I'd like to say that that is absolutely essential for our pri priorities. In 2018 already, we launched a plan around diversity and inclusion. And we have a three-year track record. Our goal is to ensure that CBC Radio Canada better reflects the public that we serve. Now, we do this in three ways. First of all, we do it through our content. Secondly, through our employees. And through our corporate culture. Last year, when we launched our new strategic plan, one of the top priorities, top five priorities, was to reflect Canada as it is today. So, in terms of concrete examples, I've got a few. There are a number, actually, of examples, but I'll give you two. As I mentioned earlier, we established a number of targets. For example, before 2025, for all shows that we produce with independent producers, 
we expect at least one key creation position, so producer or director or anything, we want that position to be occupied by somebody from a diversified sector. For our group, we have a policy around hiring new managers, including upper management. Therefore, more than 50% of people will come from diversity. Now, when it comes to TV, radio, and digital, we seek to reflect Canada's rich diversity. We fight racism, all forms of it, and we want to reflect the people who listen and watch CBC Radio Canada. We want to influence everything. <laughs> <laughs> our commitment to reflect the reality of our audiences is really at the heart of, our, of the relevance and the future of the public broadcaster. Thank you, Pat Patricia. Merci beaucoup, Catherine. Je Thank you, Catherine. I think that question is a very important one. The fact that CBC Radio Canada positions itself as a leader on this file, that's extremely important for people like me who watch CBC Radio Canada because we know that there is room for us. The next question comes from Acadia. So for people on Facebook or at home watching us on the different platforms, we're really happy to have you all with us. So here's a question that I like because it begins with recognizing the great work done. So Acadia, CBC Radio Canada, does extremely great work to give us pertinent information on a daily basis. In Acadia, we have uh, leaders, some are retired, and many people are doing volunteer work or working on different projects. What do you expect to do to value this work of these people in Acadia and elsewhere? This question is for Michel Bissonnette. Thank you very much for the question, uh, Patricia. I'm very much in agreement with that comment. The Acadian team does exceptional work. And on Monday night, we saw it again during the elections. One of the five pillars of our strategic plan is to reinforce our presence in each region with citizens. And it's fundamental because it's a distinct element between CBC Radio Canada and other media. It is that we are present in all regions across the country. Now, what I mean by that, one of the points that we selected to focus on is to increase citizen visibility. In other words, we want more citizens on our radio shows, on our cultural shows. We want to have more citizens present in our news items. So to the person asking the question, I'd like to simply say that every morning we produce radio in the morning, in the evening, in the uh, evening, we have cultural events and radio. And if you feel that you or somebody you know could contribute to increasing citizen visibility on any of our shows, please write to our to our uh, employees, and we will be happy to welcome you. Michel Bissonnette, it's great to be able to say that we do this work in the field and that you represent our communities. However, there's still work to do. And therefore, the next question sent to us uh, by Facebook, or through Facebook, rather, is a question that I'd like you to answer, Michel, if possible. When, uh, when will CBC Radio Canada recognize parity of information between Ontario and Quebec? Now, this question uh, goes a little bit uh, further. They say, I listen to news in the morning from Ontario, and the news is, or the, the parody is not necessarily uh, common. Thank you very much for the question, because you know that the national broadcaster, you know, often when we're the only source of information for francophones, then that puts us in a very uh, special and a very responsible position. Now, in Ontario, we have a radio show out of Ottawa, we have another one out of Toronto, one out of Sudbury, one out of Windsor, and then on our way home at night, 
three of those markets have an evening show. And through our radio pro programming, we try to reflect life in Ontario. And when we've got radio shows that are national, well, at that point, uh, we can have the local news announcements who are there to give everything sort of a regional flavor. This said, we are not perfect. I'm very aware of that. And often in the national broadcasting, there's too, too much Quebec, too much Montreal, and that can be an irritant for people who live outside of Quebec, the province. And I understand that. Now, unfortunately, we can't travel through the regions anymore, but I have done so many so often. And the point comes up all the time because I understand it, I accept it, and I share it. And I can assure you that we have taken a number of initiatives to do research outside of Quebec so that we reflect different regions, so that we have different candidates and different specialists who come from across the country. We want our subjects to be selected uh, f that represent all of Canada, not just Quebec. And our role is a very important one for Francophones across the country. And we can't stop working on this. This said, it's a daily fight. Every day we have to ensure that we reflective, reflexively go to the regions. But personally, I have to tell you, this is a priority for me. Yes, thank you very much for mentioning the daily fight. We often hear that comment indeed. So it's a very important question for Francophones outside of Quebec. Michel, we have another question for you from Ontario. It's focused on access to the internet. For example, we know that with the pandemic, mobility and the internet is more and more important. So here's the question. Information coming from the government is precious, especially during a crisis. And CBC Radio Canada has the duty to use uh, or share information in our language. A number of members of our community don't have access to high quality, quali high quality, high speed internet, and often they have to go to the television. So how does CBC Radio Canada expect to manage this national mandate? Well, again, it's a great question. Thank you very much. The pandemic has indeed forced us to be creative when it comes to crisis management. And each premier in each province and territory did press conferences, and often these press conferences were at the same time. So it was really challenging to manage visibility for each press conference. So what we decided was that we would broadcast regionally on the website each of these press conferences conferences so that each regions each region could have access to these press conferences we know that there is there are markets where high speed internet is not existent and at that point we tried to get radio shows in each of those communities to continue to communicate the information in each region we also had rdi broadcast over and above radio canada tv so that everybody could have RDI for free during the pandemic, for free, so that they had all the information that they required. Now, it's not a perfect solution, but unfortunately, we can't uh, multiply the signals. And there were so many press conferences at the same time that it was really difficult to broadcast them all at the same time. So we picked the lesser of all evils in the context to be able to ensure that information was shared amongst francophones in the country. Yes, the, uh, the less... Uh, the lesser of two evils. We'll give you a little break. The next question is in English now. Radio Canada leadership provide their thoughts on the future strategic direction and vision of Radio Canada International. Et ça, c'est une question qui est uh, très, très... And this question is a really important one. In our current context, uh, people get information. And this is a question for Kat Catherine Tate. We'll let uh, give some Michael Michael a chance to catch his, break, catch his breath. Thank you for that question, Patricia, and whoever posed it. Um, so uh, Radio Canada International, what we call RCI, uh, was first broadcast um, uh, during World War II. And the service has changed with the times, both in terms of the languages in which it is offered and how it is distributed. Don't forget, it started as a shortwave radio service. Um, and just to Michael's point, times change and technology evolves. Um, what has remained constant is the importance of its mandate. 
to inform people around the world about Canadian news and current affairs, and to bring Canadian perspectives, our point of view, to global audiences. So we're looking closely at how RCE can, be, can better support our priority, which uh, uh, I think Michelle mentioned we have five pillars in our strategic plan. One of them is taking Canada to the world. And so we really want to uh, try to think about how we can transform um, RCI and uh, make sure that its visibility is increased and amplified, and as well as its usage to ensure its continued relevance. Thank you. Michel Bissonnette, merci beaucoup. Michel Bissonnette, would you have something to add there? Thank you, Catherine. This is a question uh, involving a large sector of the population. So faces change, international is important. What thoughts, Michel, would you have on the role and the future of uh, RCI, Radio Canada International? Well, I think that when we have a Canadian point of view on Canadian news and that when we have a Canadian point of view on world news, I think that's important because if people only watch CNN or American sources, then the point of view is a different one than what we experience as Canadians. And so I confirm what Catherine said. The RCI mandate is extremely important for people around the world because they want to have access to what's happening in Canada. But for new arrivals in Canada, people who want to understand what news in Canada is like and the fact that we can supply information in different languages, it allows people to get integrated and to better understand Canadian life. And so our CI plays an extremely important role in that respect. Thank you, Michelle. The next question is in English. ...has been repeatedly accused of sloppy journalism. What will you do to provide an open and accountable forum for the public to voice its concerns regarding the on-screen behaviors of CBC hosts? Cette question la dirigera à... Now, this question will be given to Barb Williams. Barb, if you could answer this question around the power and politics show. Thank you. You know, Power and Politics is a really critical show for us. It is a daily live accounting of what's going on in the political landscape right across the country. And as such, it's a critical that every day we are assessing the work that that show does and being sure that it is first and foremost living up to our journalistic standards, that it is providing that fair, balanced and thorough accounting um, that we are known for and so trusted for uh, as a Canadian uh, public broadcaster. So it is important also, though, to know that in a, an attempt to be sure we have a broad perspective of opinions and ideas in that show, we bring in many, many, many panelists from, uh, from various sectors and, and industries and organizations across the country to speak with our journalists. Now, our journalists are responsible. They are hosting and managing the conversation. And those conversations sometimes can get a little um, a little boisterous uh, because people are passionate about about our politics. And, and we think that's a really critical part of what power and politics does for us too. But at the end of the day, it's important to remember uh, three things, I suppose. One, we are very, very tightly governed by what we refer to as our JSP, our journalistic standards and practices. And there are very, very, very clear rules there that our journalists need to follow to be sure that we have the integrity in our journalism that people are counting on. Secondly, there is the Ombudsman's Office, which is an important place for Canadians to know that if they do have concerns about our journalism or anything they see or hear across our CBC platforms, that they can reach out to the Ombudsman. And the Ombudsman does very thoroughly review any of those complaints or concerns that come into his office and brings those back to us. And there are very thorough conversations following those about did we misstep, how did we misstep, and how must we correct uh, any missteps that we made. And finally, I think it's important to know that this is not a one-time thing. This is every day, every day on power and politics, and every day right across our whole system, we are working at ensuring that we keep the bar very high on our integrity, because at the end of the day, if the trust factor's gone, uh, we've really lost uh, what is most important to us as a, as a public broadcaster. So we appreciate uh, the question, because it helps be sure that uh, 
that you you hold us to account and that we keep that bar high where it where it needs to be. Thank you very much, Barbara. Listen, we weren't going to go easy on any of you guys, right? So let's keep it real. Thank you for the question. Uh, the next question is for Catherine Tate. It's a question from Ontario. Not working with the GAFA to make sure that we stop the faking news. Alors ça, c'est très intéressant comme question. What an interesting question. Catherine Tate, do you have any thoughts to share? on this possible coalition uh, with uh, other broadcasters? Well, I assume you're, when you say GAFA, you're talking about Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon. And, uh, and of course, we are extremely concerned, and I think you've heard it a couple of times uh, in this conversation about the rise in disinformation, misinformation, and fake news, um, and the effect that it has had and is continuing to have on trust and our very uh, foundation of democracy. And we've committed resources in our disinformation unit at CBC and Les Decrypteurs at Radio-Canada to combat fake news each and every day, especially around COVID. But just to be clear, we are also working with the trust with these um, digital giants to combat, combat fake news. Uh, in fact, it was just over a year ago that we joined the Trusted News Initiative that's led by uh, the, the BBC. It's a global initiative that includes Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and Twitter, along with traditional players like Reuters and the Wall Street Journal and others, and CBC Radio Canada. And this Trusted News Initiative includes a commitment to collaborate on how we can authenticate news, how we can uh, improve civic and civil uh, information uh, dissemination, and also media literacy and education. So all measures to protect audiences from disinformation. But if I may, Sorry. Oh, it it is last. a big fight. It is a big fight. Uh, who's going to conquer? We need, we need some <laughs> allies on that one. We do. And, and if I, if I, as, as I've said before, Patricia, the antidote to fake news is real news. Lots of it mm -hmm. from diverse, trusted sources. And that's why at CBC Radio Canada, We've been collaborating with other trusted sources of news in Canada. We need a healthy news um, ecosystem in this country. And that means both private and public players to ensure that Canadians have choice, diversity of opinion, and are well served by all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, we saw a few minutes ago Barb William answering a question uh, about power and politics. We would go back to you, uh, Barb, uh, with a question um, that goes like this. Uh, I'd be interested to know what steps the CBC intends to take to continue or increase exposure to diverse ideas while not giving credence to uh, misinformation or conspiracy theories in the years ahead. How will we, as consumers, uh, know that CBC is presenting views that are unbiased, factual, and current while still being trustworthy? That's quite the question, uh, and it's a very great uh, lead to uh, what uh, Catherine Tate was just saying about GAFA. Yes, thank you. It, it, we have been sort of talking around this topic um, a number of times in this conversation because it is at the heart of who we are and what we do. Um, of those pillars that Michelle and Catherine have both spoken to that are the core of our strategy, it, you know, I, I think maybe the number one uh, strategy is that we must reflect contemporary Canada. So that means that that diversity of opinion that, that this question is referring to is critical, that we are constantly searching out uh, for new voices and new opinions and new ideas, and that that diversity is reflective of the many, many communities across the country. It's reflective of the many uh, backgrounds and lived experiences of our citizens, that it's reflective of the vast diversity of thought that is in our country coast to coast to coast. So how do you take that vast range of, of opinion and point of view and be sure that as you package it up into all of this content and programming, 
that you do keep the transparency, the reliability, the trustworthiness, the fair, balanced, and accountable um, um, standards uh, in place. And that, that is the work of this incredible team of journalists that, that you know work at that every single day. They go back over and over and over again to the JSP, to the journalistic standards and, and practices, and test the ideas that are being presented against against that filter. Uh, we constantly are measuring um, how did we do? We hear back from our listeners, our viewers, our users all the time. And when they come back to us with a, a point of view that says maybe we didn't meet the bar, we stop, we think about that, we question it, we review it. We sometimes correct ourselves if we if we haven't done it right and we learn from those things. We, we invest in training of our journalists all the time because as the world is changing, the, the job and responsibility of the journalist is changing too and only getting more and more complicated in a a world of disinformation um, and in the vastness of what we're trying to cover. So uh, the question's a really fair one and one that we work away at, at every single day. And what we commit to is that we will be transparent in what we do and we will be accountable for what we've done. And, and I think as long as we hold to that standard every day, Canadians can continue uh, to put the trust in us that, that they do today. The big word, you said it, Barb, trust. Uh, a really important thing uh, during these uh, hard times, especially for information. Thank you very much, Barb Williams. Uh, la prochaine question, elle est en français. The next question is in French, and it comes from Quebec. It's a question that I will direct to Michel Bissonnette. Here's the question. What is being done to ensure that artisans continue to evolve in a safe environment. We know that the arts sector in Quebec has been a victim of several incidences of harassment over the past uh, little while. Thank you for the question, Patricia. We've all been shaken by the number of cases that were raised this summer in Quebec. Uh, affecting as many people from music, theater, uh, theater arts, uh, all sorts of things. Many people have mentioned unacceptable situations. On our end, at CBC Radio Canada, I believe that we have to be a leader in a healthy work environment. And so it's zero tolerance on our production sets, among our teams, and it's zero tolerance with independent producers, the ones we work with. We have the duty and the responsibility to offer a working environment where people feel like they can create without feeling like they could possibly be harassed. And for us, that is a major priority. So I can ensure to the person asking the question that everything is in place for us to ensure a safe, healthy environment. Because the most important thing is that when people create, they have fun. We don't want them to be afraid to come onto our sets. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for this answer. The time is moving by so quickly, so quickly. We just have a few more minutes to answer one or two questions. It seems like we're just getting warmed up here. The questions are really interesting. So thank you again to all of you who have asked questions. The next question now is a question that brings us to an interesting territory. So it says pertinent for uh, English-speaking and uh, French-speaking people. When we look at n things like Netflix or social media, how does CBC Radio Canada expect to attract young people and ensure that young people consume their content? And I'll ask the question in English as well. That gives access to video content, such as Netflix, for example, or social networks. What is CBC Radio Canada's doing? What is CBC Radio Canada doing to connect with youth? Et cette question, Barb, um, Michel. Michel, do you want to take this question just for a few minutes? And then what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Barb Williams. Thank you. That's an interesting question because we often say that without a, a public, there's no public broadcaster. So we want people to have us as a sounding board. We want them to know that we are there for young people and for the older people. And so for a number of years, we announced the end of television. And honestly, when I see the performance of what's happening on TV and District 21, 
I find that the patient is not so sick and things are going really well for young people. But at the same time, we know that there are new, uh, you know, audiences who want to consume content from CBC Radio Canada on their selected platform. That's why we have 2TV. And 2TV is something that now exists. We have audio, and that's a great app to allow people to get content from spoken radio and music radio. We have RAD, which is a journalistic lab on all digital platforms, so we don't use our traditional communication platforms. We're on Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook. And it's the same thing for a small news item for younger people so that uh, we get them interested in understanding who CBC Radio Canada is. And so we try to maintain these this balance amongst all the platforms to keep our audiences, but we know that young people think differently. And so they are initiatives such as the ones that I just mentioned that are in place so that we don't drop a generation. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, uh, Barb, on this one, what do you have to add to what Michelle just said? Well, actually, I think there's um, many, many similarities between what uh, Michelle is doing in the French services side and what we're doing on the English services side. We like to think that we can build what we call a, a, a lifetime attachment to the CBC. And we know that actually we do very, very well with preschoolers and always have in our television offering. And we know we do very, very well with adults uh, and, and of all ages. Um, but there is this gap, uh, the risk of a gap of our youth, of our teens, of our preteens, um, who are, as Michelle said, discovering media in completely different ways than, than they might have done when they were younger or they may again when they are a bit older. So our challenge is to figure out how we use the vast array of platforms and, and types of content today to be sure we don't miss that generation, as Michelle says. So we do many of the same things. We use GEM uh, very powerfully to reach uh, youth, uh, our youth um, audiences the way 2.TV is used in the French side. Uh, we too are on all the social platforms on Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook uh, uh, and Twitter. We too are using audio. We're finding podcasts are a real, um, a real interest to a younger audience and so we are developing podcasts specifically with that audience in mind. And we don't forget TV. We have some, some wonderful big family programs like Heartland, which continues to be just a powerhouse for us on the traditional television schedule Sunday night. So, so I think um, you know we're putting real effort into thinking about how we move people uh, through their life cycle uh, to stay with our cycle so that uh, they're CBCers for life one way or another. Uh, awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Barb, for this explanation. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time, so we will go for a last question. And the, que the last question will be for uh, um, um, Catherine Tate. Uh, Catherine, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in the country right now around COVID-19. Uh, what, what do you see as the biggest challenge or the big challenges for CBC in the months ahead, Catherine? Wow, <laughs> another big question, Patricia, thank you for that one. Um, well, we're going to keep doing what we're doing, and uh, we're going to keep doing what we've been doing since this crisis began. And simply stated, it's serving Canadians, as Michael said. And, um, and as I said before, it's with enormous humility and um, that we all feel that our teams have been inspired and invigorated by the challenge. Um, people are worried about a second wave. They're worried about their jobs. They're worried about the economy. So providing trusted news is job number one on all CBC Radio Canada platforms. We need to remember that Canadians come to us at, to their public broadcaster across all these platforms in, in an increasingly um, myriad ways. And uh, you mentioned 24 million online. It's a huge number. <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll keep tackling the misinformation that, uh, that's out there over the coming months, especially around health and safety. Um, we, have to, we have to answer those questions that are changing all the time around COVID, on the status of COVID, and on the safety of, of Canadians and their families. Facts will be crucial. 
but we're also going to keep offering entertaining programs on TV, podcasts, radio, as well as CBC Gem and ICI TV. We know families need a break and they need a safe place for their kids. Right now, both CBC and Radio Canada have great shows uh, coming this year, this fall. We've got more than 30 series in production. Big names, Murdoch Mysteries, Kim's Convenience, District 31, Bar mentioned Heartland, just to name a few. These homegrown productions are good for Canadian creators and culture, and they're good for business too, creating millions of dollars in ac economic benefits across the country. And that's how we, the public broadcaster, will help the cultural sector contribute to the recovery um, for, during these difficult times. So, so, if I can say it in one sentence, serving all Canadians with credible, trustworthy news and information and with great homegrown entertainment, that's our mandate and that's our promise to Canadians. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you very much, Catherine. I was a bit worried when you talked about the big fight against, against uh, misinformation, and it, it is a real uh, fight that we have to uh, to lead uh, towards, uh, you know, ending those uh, this misinformation. But I think entertaining people is a good thing as well. So it's important to remind us that when we entertain people during a pandemic, it's great. We're almost at the end of our annual public meeting. Thank you to all of us for having been with us today. We will stop here. For the questions frequently asked and the answers will be posted on the uh, institution's website. Thank you to all of those of you who joined us. Thank you for sending your questions. Our guests uh, for the, the discussion, we will share the answers. Uh, to the most requested questions uh, on the CBC Radio Canada uh, corporate website later. Um, before we leave, uh, as we end this event, uh, I'd like to invite Mr. Goldblum, who we haven't seen for a few minutes now, uh, to say a few words. He's the, cha the chair of the board of directors for CBC Radio Canada. He's going to say a few words. Michael. Thank you, Patricia, and I wanted to say was thank you to you, Patricia, for having hosted this annual public meeting. And thank you to everyone who has participated in this annual public meeting. As Patricia said, the quality of the questions was very impressive. It's, it's not a surprise. Canadians care about their public broadcaster, and I was impressed with the, the quality of the questions. and. Uh, I want to say thank you to, to Catherine, to Barb, and to Michelle for the for the the clarity of their answers. So Peter? CBC Radio Canada, it, it exists to serve Canadians. And we greatly appreciate the feedback that we get from our fellow citizens. Don't so in closing, I'd like to simply say that I thank you all for having participated. And I hope that you stay safe during this pandemic affecting us all. Thank you, everybody. Bonjour. Thank you, Michael, for these closing words. At this annual public meeting, again, thank you to all colleagues, thank you to all teams who worked on this event. We'll see you again. Thank you again for having been with us during this first virtual 8 p.m. annual public meeting. It reminds us of the pandemic, but our smiles are very welcome, and we hope that you will continue to smile this afternoon and this evening. Thank you very much. Take care.